You're listening to Community Radio, CKMS, Radio Waterloo, 12.7, on the Rogers Digital Network. Happy Monday, Waterloo Region. It is the November the 9th, 2020. We have a guest in the studio today, Jim Stewart, and Rianne DeWitt will be on the phone from the um, Waterloo Region Health Coalition. We'll be talking about long-term health care legislation, privatization of health care, and a whole bunch of other things, all dealing with your health and mine. In the meantime, let's listen to Kevin California, who will be on the air with us on December the 9th, I think. And uh, this is his song, Currency, from his Timeless EP. Spend yours wisely Whether you're wealthy or you're poor Present moment can give so much more Kevin California from his Timeless EP, and he'll be in the uh, studio, or at least he'll be on the phone with us in a few weeks. I've got in the studio with me, Jim Stewart from the uh, Waterloo Region Health Coalition. Good morning, Jim. Uh, good morning, Bob. It's and, great to be here. Thank you for having us. And on the phone is Rianne DeWitt, also from the Waterloo Region Health Coalition. Good morning, Rianne. And I'm thinking that Rianne can't hear us, or we've, uh, we've dropped her. Well, can you tell us, uh, Jim... First of all, what's the Waterloo Region Health Coalition? Where do we start from? Uh, okay. The WRCA. HC. Sure. Uh, the Waterloo Region Health Coalition is a chapter uh, here in the Waterloo Region, obviously, of the Ontario Health Coalition, which is an organization that's prov province-wide. And the Ontario Health Coalition, and obviously the Waterloo Region Health Coalition, is really focused on attempting to protect and strengthen our public health care, something that most, almost all Ontarians cherish, something that we actually take for granted at times, but something that we all uh, define as uh, something that's distinct in our society versus other societies, especially the American one just south of the border. And uh, WRHC is your standard non-governmental organization, a grassroots citizen-led organization yes exactly I wish I had thought to say that absolutely <laughs> yeah we uh, are, are made up or comprised of ordinary uh, people from across Ontario across the region people who 
have had uh, some interest in healthcare, people who would like to see it strengthened, and people who realize what's, what level of attack our public health care system is under right now. What are, you, you were in with us back in, in May of 2019, and I think the focus of the conversation at that time was uh, the privatization of healthcare, the stealth methods by which the provincial government was uh, trying to move healthcare away from the public domain uh, into the private domain. Where are we at with that? Well, uh, unfortunately, that, that activity by the Government of Ontario under Mr. Ford continues and has actually accelerated. The problem, of course, is now it's compounded by what's happening with the pandemic, with COVID. And so what we've seen is a twofold sort of level of effort by the government of, on government of Ontario. One is a reasonable effort to uh, attack the pandemic and get it under control. And quite frankly, to, uh, to, you know, to be very honest, the government of Ontario has made some very good uh, initiatives around uh, controlling the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, the series of stages in terms of how you control the pandemic, the uh, uh, approach uh, at the public level uh, around masks and social distancing and, and using uh, hand washing, et cetera, all very wise precautions that have assisted us and ensured that our death rates and our case counts are much lower than other uh, societies across the world, especially what's happening in the USA. When you look at an administration, both federally and at the state level, that seems to be very disjointed, confused, and, and lack any kind of coordinated uh, process. We haven't had that in Ontario. So that's the so kudos to Mr. Ford for that. However, at the same time, and this is the critical piece for us, at the exactly the same time, under the covers of all of this COVID activity, what we've seen is a series of different pieces of legislation that have come out that are really designed to completely dismantle public health care. It's a complete betrayal of our public health care system and that level of stealth, that level of privatization and uh, destruction of something that we've built over, you know, many, many decades is ongoing. Is it the case that the government is just not paying attention to the needs of the people and focusing on business um, and prioritizing business over uh, individual citizens' health care? Well, I mean, that would be an aspect of it, but fundamentally, we believe it's a philosophical distinction that the Conservative government of Ontario really believes that this concept of privatization is, you know, to use their buzzwords, you know, is going to make, is going to streamline our health care, that, you know, the, the uh, private sector will be able to do a very good job at delivering health care, that people would be willing to pay more for their health care if they could avoid, you know, having to stand in line or anything for some level of health care. And quite frankly, I find that absolutely absurd because what we're seeing right in front of our eyes by looking at what's going on in the USA is that that system, that market-based system, that philosophical drive towards free enterprise in health care has been a disaster for Americans. It's not only far more expensive, it's much less efficient, and it's also uh, unable to provide the level of care, the outcomes that our public system uh, provides on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. I think we have Riani with us at the moment. Good morning, Riani. Hi, Bob. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Uh, I had the oh, wrong button okay. pushed. It's all my okay. fault. Okay. <laughs> and hello, everybody else there. Hi, Riani. <laughs> Hi. How are you, Jim? Doing well. Good. Do you have any, uh, any commentary to add to that on how the uh, provincial government is handling the COVID crisis at the moment? Um, they're not. Um, <laughs> it's the short of it. Um, it's, it's a lot of press conferences and a lot of announcements of things that they're planning to do. Um, but they, they were caught 
of Futit in March, which which one can almost sort of partly excuse. It, it was an unforeseen event. But, but we are now in November, and we, we had a very nice lull all over the summer, and that gave them so much time and opportunity to start introducing the measures to make sure that we're not facing the same situation in the fall and winter that we did in, in March and April. And we knew we were facing a second wave. And now that that second wave is sticking up all over the province, it is clear that they have squandered the six months um, grace period that they had to fix things. Um, if we think of the long-term care homes, for instance, they have done nothing to improve the situation there. Um, especially not when you compare them to other provinces like British Columbia and Quebec, where they've made really good strides to, to, to do better. British Columbia did well in the first wave already, and they improved on their care. Uh, Quebec had a very bad run in the first wave, but they've taken a lot of steps to make sure that they're not hit with the same um, statistics and, and, and casualties that, that they faced during the first wave. But in Ontario, we, we don't see that. Um, like I say, we see a lot of promises and, and, and they have a plan and they're going to do things, but we, there is no plan. There, there's no clear strategy. And in fact, sadly, it seems that they've even in some ways moved backwards because instead of tightening control over these private care facilities, where we saw the biggest uh, number of, of um, outbreaks and deaths, they've actually given them more leeway to pursue their own ways in other words, to do even worse than they did before. We've seen one of the medical officers of health, Dr. Lowen Peel, um, sort of take his own stance and um, impose further restrictions than what the government is actually mandating. Um, is this the future? Is this how things need to progress in order to protect the citizens? It, it might be the best option for regions if the provincial government isn't giving um, clear goals and standards. But I think, again, Jim referred to, to the situation with privatization down south. But I think we can also, if we look at one of the biggest issues that is driving the, the, the very high COVID numbers, case numbers and casualty numbers in, in the U.S., is the fact that they didn't have a national coordinated approach. It was very much uh, every state to itself and everybody make up their own rules as they go along. And we've seen that in countries where you have a more federally coordinated approach, it works better. And that works at a state, at, at a provincial level as well. It is better for the province if we have a coordinated strategy, even if we are at different stages in different areas in the province. But if we had a clear provincial strategy, it just works better for everybody because people are mobile. People do move between one part of the province and another part of the province. Um, so in the absence of, of a clear and, and a good provincial strategy, yes, we absolutely need to rely on our regional governments to step up to the plate and assume that function. But in an ideal situation, we would have hoped for better strategies and better planning to come from the province. And maybe I could jump in here just a little bit to add some specifics to what Rianne has just said, and of course she's completely correct about this, this lack of strategy. We know that COVID has hit a residence in long-term care very severely. And what is the government of Ontario doing today to fix this epidemic within long-term care? And as Rianne just mentioned, it's very woefully inadequate. If we compare what happened in British Columbia six months ago, the province of uh, British Columbia decided that, yes, they are having a problem with the lack of PSW workers, full-time PSWs in long-term care facilities in, in their long-term care uh, homes because they weren't being paid very well. And we have exactly the same situation in Ontario. So what did BC do? It's decided it would put, uh, put down some legislation that would pay the PSWs in long-term care $21.75 an hour for f and, and ensure that they had full-time work. 
after the pandemic, there was a review, after the first wave, there was a review comparing BC's uh, 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 response to the pandemic in long-term care to all of the other provinces. And what we found in that review is a far less death uh, and uh, because of the stabilized workforce that was in the long-term care facilities in British Columbia. Now, what happened in Quebec? Quebec's very similar to us. They had the same level of outbreaks, just as many people, and, and they had the same situation that we currently face in Ontario. Not very many PSWs, they're not paid very well, they're all part-time workers, they've got no benefits, they work shift work, it's a very tough job. Their average a, uh, wage here in, in uh, the Waterloo region is only $16 an hour. So it's very, and we know that the shelf life of a PSW in Waterloo region from start to finish of that career is only 13 months. And that's because there's no pathway to full-time employment in Ontario. So what did Quebec do? Well, the province of Quebec decided that they were going to have a recruitment, a training, and a payment program for PSWs in this vital role in long-term care. They hired 10,000 new PSWs in the last three months. 10,000 and they paid them $21 an hour just to get trained. So that's, you know, two full semesters of training for a PSW to be certified. And then they ensured that when they start their job, that they get both full-time work with benefits and everything, and that they get a raise of to $26 an hour for this incredibly critical level of work. So that's what the, Quebec, uh, the province of Quebec has done. That's what the province of uh, British Columbia has done. And what have we done in Ontario? We gave our PSWs, our existing PSWs, very few of them, all working part-time, a $3 uh, an hour raise that will be is now being extended to March. That's it. There's no recruitment program, there's no training program in place, and there's no hope that we're going to uh, hire about 10,000 PSWs. Actually, in Ontario, we need more than Quebec does because we're bigger. Well, there's no hope that we're going to get that level of PSW increase in, in time for the second wave. Does Ontario even have the training capacity to train 10,000 new PSWs? I think we do. Uh, we could have that if there was concerted effort by the province of Ontario to get this type of training involved. But you can't just train anybody. You need a recruitment strategy in place. You've got to ensure that the population understands that there's a good job here available for them long term. Uh, that it's going to be safe for them mm -hmm. to go into these long-term care facilities, that they will be provided with all the appropriate PPE and yeah. infection control policies. And again, as Rianne referenced, those strategies also have not been put in place yeah. in long-term care in Ontario. It's a disaster. It's hard can work. I just add, can go I ahead, just go ahead, add to that, Bob? In addition to recruiting and training new people, how about if they just... If you, if you offer decent working conditions, if you go out and say, okay, we are going to employ PSWs as full-time employees, we're going to pay them 23 or 25 or $26 an hour instead of 15 or $16 an hour, and you start by going to all the people who are trained as PSW workers but who have left the industry because of the bad conditions, and you just start with those people that already have the training, give them the motivation to come back into the field. And you will have gone a long way towards addressing some of these shortages. Um, and then you can start focusing your energy on recruiting and training new people into the field as well. But, but I fear even if we do have a massive recruitment drive suddenly, and we do get 10,000 new PSW workers, like Jim said, the attrition rate in, in our region is 30 months. So we're giving these people 13 months and they're going to be totally, totally physically, emotionally exhausted and, and, and leave the field. The provincial government has actually made it worse for PSW in restricting um, their ability to move between different facilities, you know, which is a good thing during the COVID pandemic because you don't want PSWs who are you know, at higher risk of, of uh, exposure and, and then transmission you don't want them to be going to these um, congregate settings where they could possibly spread um, the virus. But 
it has reduced their work ability to half of what it used to be. I, I know there are PSWs who are working two and possibly three different jobs at different long-term care facilities just in order to make ends meet because they're part-time employees at just slightly over minimum wage. So it's yes, worse for them. Also, that, that is not a bug. That is a feature because the purpose there is to, if we keep employing a lot of part-time PSW workers, we don't have to pay them full-time benefits. Uh, that, that's that's a uh, feature that for the government, not a feature for the PSWs. Well, no, exactly. It's a feature for the government, yes, but, but primarily it's a feature for the private owners of long-term care facilities because this is more of a problem in long-term care facilities that are privately owned than in the ones that are publicly owned. So if instead we say that you need to stop this practice of employing 10 people part-time and employ five people full-time because those 10 people part-time are five, ten of them are working three hours a day here and four hours a day there. But if, if, you, if you start adding up, they're all working full-time jobs, but they just work them at different facilities. If they instead work a full-time job at a facility, they still all have their hours, but they have it at one facility and they get the benefit of being a full-time employee. Okay, so again, just to add to that, and again, Rianne is right on, uh, right on the ball here, there's a couple of things that we have to also ensure that people understand, and that is that the Ontario Health Coalition and the Waterloo Region Health Coalition for decades now have been working towards what we call the standard of care in long-term care. And that standard of care is four hours per patient per day of clinical care. And that's not very much. That's a minimal standard. But right now in Ontario, uh, we are only seeing about 2.1 hours of clinical care. So less than half the minimum that's been established over 20 years ago in this field. So we've been advocating for that through numbers of reports, like our, our mission critical uh, report last year. We, uh, we've done staffing reports. Uh, the Ontario Nursing Association has done similar activities. The uh, a variety of different, even uh, 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 community groups, like uh, the people, uh, the resident committees and different long-term care homes have been expressing this complete need for many years now. And the government has just recently announced that, uh, yes, well, that's wonderful, under Bill... Uh, 13, uh, let me just double check my bills because there's been a raft of bills <laughs> coming out from, from, from the government of, of care, uh, yeah. the government of Ontario on health care. And basically what that, what that has done, that Bill 13, that Time to Care Act, is, is, is establish a mandate to make an announcement for a standard of care. And people may have been aware of what happened last week. The government of Ontario came out and said, we are going to implement this four-hour standard of care. We realize this is what we need. Well, after decades of effort, they now realize this is what we need, yeah. but... And this has been the standard of care all along. It just hasn't been met. Absolutely, but <laughs> the government of Ontario failed to make uh, clear in their announcement that this standard of care won't take effect until... Uh, until there's another election. So it's not going to be implemented for four years. Yeah. Four yeah, years. I think, I think their and target date is 24 25. So yeah. this is not something. And, and can I also just add to what Jim has said? This sudden revelation of the government that, oh, they need to implement this, this is not because they cleverly thought it out. This is because the commission that was established after the damning report issued by the army earlier this year. Mm -hmm. That report has now come out, and that report said that they need to implement the four-hour standard. And as like Jim says, this is not a new thing. This is something that, that the coalition and many other organizations in the field have been shouting out for and, and begging for for the last 15 to 20 years. Now, people think, uh, Bob, <laughs> that... Uh, now that we're in the second wave, we're probably going to be a little bit smarter about how we're going to deal with COVID in long-term care facilities. And just to sort of uh, finish my thoughts here, 
in October of 2020, so just at the end, just a couple of weeks ago, in Ottawa, in one particular uh, extended care facility, that's a for-profit long-term care facility mm -hmm. in Ottawa called West End Villa, we had a situation where the staff were, you know, understaffed, of course, because they're PSWs, and some of them got uh, contracted COVID. And so we had a situation where there was only two PSWs, two PSWs in the entire facility on shift for a 24-hour period to take care of 60 COVID positive patients. So that's the ratio of one PSW for 30 COVID positive patients. And that's not, we're not even addressing the needs of all of the other residents in this facility. And just, just to be clear, PSWs aren't not nursing staff. They're, no. no, that's correct. They're not a regulated profession. And right. unlike the province of Quebec again, who not only hired these 10,000 additional PSWs because there's a huge need for them, they also implemented in that same piece of legislation that there has to be an RN on staff and that there has to be a director of nursing on staff and that there has to be a competent management team in the, the residents and that that competent management team also has to be paired with an infection control specialist. And that's in Quebec, in, not in Ontario. In Quebec, not yes. in Ontario. So they have a plan. And as uh, Rianne just referred to, we don't. Yeah. And, and can I just, uh, I want to first clarify something. When we talk about the four-hour standard of care, we used to have a, a legislated set standard of care, but that was scrapped um, in the late 90s by the Harris government. They removed the minimum standard of care. So we haven't had one, although we've been lobbying for one all this time. So once this comes into effect four years down the line, that will be a great improvement. Um, in terms of what Jim said about having an R in on staff, you know, when you, when you sit back and you reflect for a minute, people often confuse long-term care facilities with retirement facilities. They are not. They are long-term care facilities. They are people who need care and attention. Yes. So the, fact, the, the, the mere thought that we have these facilities and we do not have full-time doctors and RNs on staff at all times, it is shocking and absurd. How do you have a facility where people have long-term medical care needs and you don't have at all times, a nurse and a doctor on staff. Yeah. How is that possible? So some nursing on staff and on duty at, at yeah, all times. Yes, yes, yes. Not, exactly. Not just have an RN on staff. There should be at least one RN. But, but even, I think for me, even when you talk about 60 people and you have one RN on duty, yeah. even that is ridiculous. You, you surely should have more than that. Yeah. Um, in terms of the infectious control, um, uh, specialists at the facilities. I was shocked at the outbreak, um, especially after we had gone through SARS, w which also had a heavy toll in mm -hmm. nursing uh, in, in, in long-term care facilities. I was shocked to, to realize that to this day, this is not a basic requirement at a long-term care facility, that, that they should have uh, an infectious uh, disease control specialist on staff, or even a policy. It seems they don't even have a policy that if this happens, if there is an infectious disease, these are the protocols you need to implement immediately. And this is why we had this heavy toll, is because those policies did not exist. The government never thought it necessary to check that these policies exist or to mandate their existence. And so what happened is where once COVID hit, Every nurse, every long-term care facility was sort of like out in the cold on their own. Oh, my gosh, what are we going to do now? Instead of knowing this is the protocol that we have to implement immediately. Right. So the Ontario Health Coalition and all the regional health coalitions have changed tack a little bit. Instead of approaching uh, members of provincial parliament uh, directly and trying to advocate for change at the political level, you've moved it into the public sphere. Yes, we have. Uh, we have invested heavily for us, which isn't saying much, in uh, uh, radio spots to sort of highlight 
the the issues around uh, long term care and with PSWs, mm -hmm. the fact that there's no plan. We have tried going to the media. We're here today to sort of express the same concerns that uh, there is no plan for long term care. And as I mentioned, what's happening in Ottawa is just a precursor of what we're going to see in the second wave yeah. because we still don't have proper isolation uh, established at protocols established in long-term care. We still don't have appropriate levels of PPE in long-term care in the second wave, despite uh, uh, what the government is telling us, because we have done some covert uh, staff reviews. We've asked the staff who are, you know, we've had to be very quiet about this yeah. because they could get fired mm -hmm. if they say anything negative about what's actually happening. And, and they don't want to leave their residents high and dry without yet yes. another PSW. So it's a very critical area, but they're waiting for tests. The, 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 the numbers, uh, the staff ratios to patients are incredibly high. We've got 93% of all of the shifts are short staffed every day in every facility that we have mm -hmm. talked to for every single shift. So there's no action on staffing levels today, November 2020. We haven't seemed to learn the lesson. This is what your media campaign was trying to address to bring awareness to the public. Absolutely. I'd like to take, uh, what, 30 seconds out uh, and, and have a listen to that spot. And you can uh, discuss how uh, the Ontario Health Coalition came about to producing something like this. It's a tragedy. More than 1,900 residents and staff have died from COVID-19 in Ontario's long-term care homes. Even before COVID, the homes were short-staffed every day. Now, the staffing shortage is a full-blown emergency. Our loved ones can't get the care they need. Our caregivers are exhausted. Premier Ford, we are calling on you to increase staffing, improve wages, and require a minimum of four hours of care per resident. It's time to act. A message from the Ontario Health Coalition. So I'm sure that in response to that, the Ontario government has now made that announcement saying that, yes, uh, they're going to be increasing the uh, minimum care standard. And uh, as far as they're concerned, I believe the problem is solved. Yes. Uh, well, you know. Well, if we still have COVID with us in 2024, it will solve that problem. <laughs> um, but right now, no, it does not. Yeah. So, so, so how did the uh, Ontario Health Coalition uh, come around to addressing the public rather than uh, the legislators? Because of the inaction uh, of the various uh, MPPs in the provincial government. So right here in, in Waterloo Region. So right here in Waterloo Region, as well as the inaction of the Conservative government across, uh, the, across the province and uh, especially at Queen's Park. And because of their intransigence, they have uh, again, this philosophical desire to move us away towards some sort of privatization, low cost, low wage model for long term care. They seem to be completely focused on this laissez faire approach to long term care. And of course, long term care is completely dominated by for profit corporations. So that long term care profit lobby is very effective, very integrated. At, at the provincial government level. There's all kinds of relationships between ex-conservative premiers and uh, MPs in, in Queen's Park and in the long-term care lobby. And of course, <laughs> the, the, to add uh, you know, insult to injury, these long-term care uh, corporations have been continuing to provide millions of dollars in uh, shareholder uh, to the shareholders during the pandemic at the s exactly the same time when we have this lack of uh, employment standard and this lack yeah. of care standard. Profit money that would be better off going to investing in the delivery of health care. Yes. Well, yes. And what we found in our report is that when you look at the difference between private LTCs and the public LTCs, more money is spent on on care of residents in, in the public facility, whereas in the private facility, sorry, I'm having an echo and it's <laughs> feeling weird. Um, in the private facilities, they don't spend as much 
money on the on the patients. That money goes into their bottom profit line. Right. Yeah, that's always going to be the case. Now, I understand that um, not only is a former premier on the board of one of the major for-profit um, healthcare centres here in Ontario, but a whole chain of for-profit healthcare centres is actually owned somehow through uh, by, by the federal government. I was uh, reading just uh, recently that uh, Rivera Homes actually has as one of its major investors the federal government. So. That's not public health care, that's private ownership by the government. Yes, and what I have to say is especially with this current COVID crisis, it has made a lot of people aware to look where their uh, unions, their associations invest their money. Because the Rivera, it is the public service fund, I think, that, that owns a lot of shares there. So people are starting to ask questions. Do we really want our money invested in these facilities? Yeah. And how can workers, how can people direct um, their union fees and, and, and other investment vehicles away from privatized health care? Well, well, we can advocate. Oh, sorry, Jim. I'm sorry, Annie. Uh, I, I'm just saying we could advocate for the public, uh, public ownership of the Rivera chain because it's 100% owned by PSW, the pension, uh, uh, the pension program for the, uh, the government of Ontario. It's distinct from the government of Ontario, but it's owned by this pension plan and that's fully supported by the uh, by the pensioners, by the uh, I'm sorry, sorry, by the contributors yeah, to the, the contributors pension, plan. pension plan. And so consequently, uh, we could just simply say they have done such a poor job, such a terrible job at providing care in long-term care that Riviera Chain in particular have been a horrible that they no longer should be able to make money on the backs of this pandemic and that they should become uh, public. It's a very easy step for us to do that and also Quite frankly, if you do uh, such a terrible job at delivering care, shouldn't your license be revoked? Why would we accept that this pathetic level of care can be ongoing without any consequences? If it was a private corporation and the CEO operated in this manner, he would be uh, eliminated. And so that's what we're suggesting, that there's a loud and vocal public support for eliminating the license for Rivera and ensuring that Rivera simply transfers into the back into the public domain. Well, if that were to happen, if the license for one of these long-term private care facilities were to be terminated, they were no longer licensed to provide long-term care, what happens to the residents? How would the residents fare without having a licensed facility available? It would still be a licensed facility but it would be operating under a different ownership model. So it's the owners that would have the yes. license revoked, not yes, the, the uh, owners. Okay. Yeah, the owners would have the license revoked. There would be a public board of directors who would be operating in the in, a, in public spirit. And of course, we have that model in place today in Ontario. There are about 30% of the long-term care uh, facilities are still public owned uh, public long-term care facilities. So it's that model that's done remarkably well, as Rianni just referred to, the non-profit versus profit, profit model has done a better job at taking care of their uh, residents in, during the pandemic. At, at what level of government would public ownership take place? I understand that there's some municipal facilities in places like Hamilton. I don't know if there's any in Waterloo Region. Or would this be at the provincial level, or would you even consider a federal um, managed? Well, it wouldn't care? be. It would not be at a federal level. It would be managed at the uh, provincial level, but more reasonably, it would be managed at the municipal level. Because you're well, correct, we do have a variety of different uh, municipally run and charitably run long-term care facilities across the province and right here in Waterloo Region. And in Waterloo. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just thinking, you mentioned earlier about the licensing. It's 
also, you know, it raises questions about how some of these groups got their licenses. Um, Extendica, for instance, they used to operate in the U.S., and then they got faced with a bunch of wrongful death and negligence lawsuits. They withdrew from the U.S., and they came to Canada, and we gave them a license. So how does that happen? When a company comes to you, they say, we want to have a long-term care home. You don't look at their track record. You don't ask questions. Um, so these are things we need to consider. The other thing that I, I had a look at the boards of these long-term care facilities, the private ones, and all of the board members, they are bankers, insurance agents, um, property management, business strategists. You know who you don't find on there? People who are professionals in long-term care. Hmm. You don't find nurses there. You don't find the doctors there. You don't find the PSWs there. It's business and money, money-making people. So that tells you what their priority is. Yeah. Maybe yeah. this would be a good time for me to bring up uh, something that we uh, alluded to earlier about what's actually happening under the covers of the COVID blanket. And so there's, as I mentioned earlier, some legislation that's being brought forward. And it's precisely what uh, Ariani was just alluding to, Bill 218 is called Supporting Ontario's Recovery and, and Municipal Elections Act 2020. That's a very <laughs> euphemistic name, but in reality, what that bill is all about with respect to long-term care is limiting liability. So it's a Long-Term Care Liability Protection Act. And the reason why that's come about is because the long-term care uh, a lobby has been faced with this reality now that the insurance companies that insure long-term care facilities have said that they're not going to pay for COVID-related costs. All of the expenses around the pandemic, they are not insured for. And so what has this long-term care lobby done? Well, I'll tell you what they've done. They've decided that they're going to ensure that uh, they're fully protected because they're at the same time that the insurance companies have refused to, uh, to uh, protect them from liability, there's been a series of uh, mass torts or you know, uh, large cases coming against class action suits, coming against long-term care facilities so that uh, people who have seen their loved ones die are being so terribly mistreated in long-term care, there's going to be some consequences. So these uh, legislative actions are in place. And what did the long-term care lobby do? Well, they lobbied the government effectively that they're in bed with, and, they've cre and the government has come out with Bill 218, which is a <laughs> reprehensible piece of legislation. Basically what it does is three things. It raises the bar from, uh, for long-term care to ensure that it's no longer simple negligence that, they, that they're being sued for, but it's gross negligence, and the plaintiff, uh, the plaintiff has to prove gross negligence. It ensures that uh, the bar is, is, is uh, lowered for the defense, the long-term care facilities, so they no longer have to prove that they did something in good faith, a good faith effort. They now, which requires a reasonable and competent effort, now all they have to prove is that they have done an honest effort, whether that's reasonable or not, and who gets to define what's an honest effort. And finally, it's retroactive to March 17, 2020, so that all of these class action suits and these mass torts uh, will be eliminated because that's precisely the start date of when the pandemic hit the long-term care. So it extinguishes all the rights, all the claims, all the costs and compensation for anyone who has started any kind of legal proceedings against these long-term care for-profit uh, uh, facilities. And as Rianni said, you know, we've seen this before in Kentucky and in Florida and in eight other states uh, extended care, the one that Rianni was speaking mm -hmm. to, was decided that they would leave the states because uh, they, they lost to the U.S. Department of Justice. 
and they had to pay $38 million because the Department of Justice said that they had provided substandard, now quote this, substandard nursing services that were so deficient that they were effectively worthless. This is in long-term care facilities in the U.S. And so subsequently, as we Annie just mentioned, extended care closed up its shops its long-term mm -hmm. care facilities in America and moved to Canada. Where the standards don't exist. It's shocking, so, isn't it? What is the Ontario Health Coalition and uh, Waterloo Region Health Coalition, what action are you taking? Well, uh, I mean, we continue to fight the fight. I mean, we understand that we're a small voice, yeah. and this is why we, we, we appreciate CKMS for giving us a voice to speak to this. We continue to produce at enormous expense for us uh, the ads similar to the one that you've just uh, produced. Mm -hmm. We have a campaign of uh, days of protest where we try to get the media involved in it, but with the pandemic, much of our voice has been drowned out recently. Those were the pop-up protests that you were holding uh, outside the offices of the local MPPs. Also, on October 8th, we did uh, a drive-through uh, rally, mm -hmm. a day of protest around long-term care and, uh, and what's happening in home care, which is a whole other issue. Uh, yes. I'd be happy to talk about that. But we did that at Amy Fee's office, and we had uh, you know uh, about 45 different people with signs on their cars honking as they drove by Amy Fee's office. Have uh, you, the Water Region Health Coalition, uh, had any success in meeting with the various MPPs? Uh, as of May of last year, only Amy Fee had actually allowed you into their office, and I understood that uh, there was very little in the way of, um, of response from the office after you'd met. Yes, that's true, but we did meet subsequently with Mike Harris, Jr. in Elmira, mm -hmm. and uh, his thoughts, his statements on that, because at that time we were very much concerned about Bill 74, another piece of legislation that's dismantling, as we mentioned in our last interview, all of public health care and pushing it towards a, a market-based uh, reality, using the super agency as the club right. to, to transfer public assets into the private domain, public assets into private control and and that is proceeding that's as we speak that's legislation that's ongoing that's terrifying because we don't know uh, what the outcome will be and because there's no uh, plan that we can review but there's also no public input there's no ability to review or even be informed under that legislation as to what's occurring in our region or across the province so it's a very deeply disturbing because I don't know if we will actually recognize our own public health care system yeah. when all of this is finished. Yeah. Now, the Canada Health Act, we were speaking of that a little bit earlier, still mandates that the provinces deliver health care, not that private institutions deliver health care. So is that not something that uh, we can fall back on, having the uh, federal government um, essentially compel the provincial governments to do the health care delivery? Well, you've actually put your finger on the problem there. The Canada Health Act does not mandate the provinces to deliver health care. It mandates them to administer it, which means that technically they can have private agencies deliver as long as they manage the disbursement of funds. And that's why, for instance, when you, took, mm. uh, when you look at libra uh, sorry, laboratory services, most of it in the province is outsourced. Now, the sad thing is many of our hospitals have the capacity to do a lot of that la laboratory services, but they don't have the staffing and the funding because we're putting it towards the private sector. Why can't we rather take that money, push it into our hospitals, and have it as a public service. Yeah. It must be exhausting to fight the same fight over and over and over. And when the government makes an announcement that sounds like it's a victory for the health coalition, it's really just rhetoric and, and words with no action behind it. 
how do you manage to sustain a level of activism? Well, it's, it is difficult, it is exhausting, uh, but we have a lot of people who are very committed to our public health care system, people who see the value of public health care. It's the kind of system that we're incredibly proud of. It's just that people are ill-informed about or even misinformed by the government of what's actually happening. And another example of, of this is what's happening in home care. This Bill 75 came out, again, under the cover of COVID. It's called the Privatizing Home Care Act. And, well, it's actually the actual name is Connecting People to Home and Community Care Act of 2020. That's the euphemistic name of it, but it's a complete transfer of all aspects of home care delivery to the, the privatized model. So it's not just the delivery of uh, home care in a privatized fashion, but the actual administration, the case management, the deciding of who's getting home care and how much home care they're gonna get and at what profit level are they going to receive that home care. So getting back to your point, we need to ensure that the population of Ontario understands where we're at with health care. And as Alani, uh, 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 Riani just uh, mentioned, we have uh, privatized laboratory services across the province. The long-term care industry is dominated for, with for-profit long-term care chains. Home care is almost 100% privatized. We have a continuing expansion under Bill 74 of private clinics that will deliver all of the services that used to be delivered in hospital scenarios. And you have to ask yourself, and of course, all of our primary medicine, that's all of our doctors delivering care, they're all private. They are private entrepreneurs. You know, they've got, you know, they get the bill OHIP. Mm -hmm. uh, so it makes them slightly different, but they're all private. And so you have to ask yourself, what's left of public health care? How much of public health care are we willing to give away? How much can we possibly give away and still have a public health care system? So that's why, even though it's exhausting, we continue to fight. Is there anything that Waterloo Region Health Coalition is planning in the way of public action that as a citizen, I can participate in to, uh, to make my voice heard? Uh, at this point, I'd have to say no. <laughs> and that's because of COVID. The reality of COVID has uh, really uh, curtailed our ability to have public gatherings, our ability to ha hold mass demonstrations, our ability to have uh, town halls that we had pre-pandemic, and I'm sure uh, when the pandemic ha has been resolved, that we will certainly go back to those levels of effort and that level of exposure because that's the best way for us to get our message out to the public. So in the meantime, what can people do to get involved? Is well, there... well we, we have, they, one of the most important things that they could do would be to support us financially. And by that, I mean going to the Ontario Health Coalition's website and subscribing to the Ontario Health Coalition uh, as a supporter of the Ontario Health Coalition. So whatever they can uh, provide us in terms of financial assistance would be greatly appreciated because we have a very small staff. And of course, if we want to produce more of these ads, they're very costly, not just to produce, but also to disseminate through the uh, media because we have to pay for, uh, for our time, yeah. obviously. And uh, so that would be incredibly helpful at this point, but we would also like people to join our organization, to get involved, to help us uh, reach out to our MPPs and to continue to pressure uh, the Ford administration towards doing things in a, a quicker fashion, like implementing the standard of care. So it's with that advocacy over all of these many years, it's a small win for us, but it's still a win and we can't do it alone. We need your help. And how do Can people... Just, so, one of the things that makes it difficult 
is that the current government has a propensity towards ramming legislation through. So we, there's not really ample lead-up time to see, oh, here's the legislation, this is the impact, let's inform everybody, let's all... By the time you're there, they've already pushed it right through the parliament yeah. uh, or through the legislature. The so government can move fast enough when it's in their interest. Yeah, and, and then when they have public hearings, it's really difficult for people to get access to that, to give testimony or, or argue in front of those because they limit how many people can make um, a presentation. We often find that less than a quarter of the people who apply actually get time to speak to the committees. Yeah. How can people get a hold of you if they do want to get involved and possibly provide financial assistance? What's the best way to get a hold of Waterloo Region Health Coalition? Well, uh, to provide financial assistance, uh, I would ask them to go to the Ontario Health Coalition's website. Mm -hmm. So that's OHC. Just type yeah, in Ontario, Ontario Health, Health Coalition, Coalition in, in Google and you'll get there. And uh, you'll, you'll see very quickly how you can contribute. Uh, they can also, we have a, a, a Waterloo Region Health Coalition Facebook page. Mm -hmm and website, so uh, uh, Rianni, uh, it's quite easy to uh, get on, but we do not have a, uh, a way of capturing uh, revenue, so if they want to support us locally, we'd ask for a check made payable to Waterloo Region Health Coalition, or to just call us or email us at Waterloo Region Health Coalition at gmail.com. So I'll repeat that email address again, It's lengthy but it's all one word waterloo region health coalition at gmail.com and i'll certainly have all those links on the show notes for uh, this episode radiowaterloo.ca slash ccc it's actually up already so if you uh, browse over in that direction now you'll see the various links to the facebook page uh, the ontario health coalition page and uh, get yourself involved you know this is your health care uh, speaking to you now the listeners it's uh, your health care and, well, just uh, something else, if people can keep talking about it. Because, you know, you asked how we keep it going. When that letter from the army came out, and we had Ford and some of his ministers on television, and they were so shocked, and it's so horrible, and how could this happen? I wanted to cry and yes. shout at the same time. Because the, it's, they were not unaware. Yeah. These are issues that have been raised with them, year after year for the last 25 years. Definitely have but to get you back on the air again, uh, Rianni and Jim, because okay. this, is, this is not over by any means. Certainly yeah. not. Yeah. Rianni Duet and Jim Stewart from the Waterloo Region Health Coalition, thank you very much for spending an entire hour with me here. <laughs> and, uh, Thanks, Bob. Delivering thank you, Bob. some information to people on the state of, of health care here in Ontario. You've been listening to CKMS Community Connections on CKMS Radio Waterloo. CKMS Community Connections is sponsored by Radio Waterloo. Executive producer is Jennifer Strong. Associate producers are Jeff Steger, Dylan Bravener, and uh, J James Jordan, uh, Jordan Dorans, who hosts the Saturday edition, where you can hear Community Connections again at noon on Saturday. My name is Bob Jonkman. Back again next week, we're listening to Dan Walsh, who's actually our guest next week. See you then. <laughs>